Good morning. So welcome to week 12. Today is the second lesson in uh, the advanced topics. So today we will see some special matrices. These are matrices that are worthy enough to have their own name. Then we will move on to what we mean by similarity of matrices. And finally, we will wrap it up with some algorithms specifically to compute eigenvalue decomposition, eigenvectors. And we might take stock of uh, all the algorithms that we've learned so far also. So let's get started. So today we will be dealing with matrices that are special enough to have their own names. So the first one would be Hermitian. Hermitian is actually just a generalization of a symmetric matrix. Then Markov matrices, we've seen them last week when we when we did uh, the Google page and algorithm. Then a new class of matrices called positive definite matrices. They are like uh, real symmetric but with one additional property which will make them very desirable in our book, especially for computer science. Then gram matrices, we've been uh, talking about them on and off throughout this course because they are real symmetric and it will turn out that they are actually positive definite also and they are also very important from a data science perspective and from a mathematical perspective theoretical linear algebra kind of perspective there are other matrices called Jordan box and that also leads to something called a Jordan normal form of a matrix and then we will look at some of the properties of these matrices and prove some of them not all of them but all the proofs almost all the proofs are there in the textbook. Then as the last part of our today's lecture we will move on to algorithms specifically to compute eigenvalue decomposition. At the same time we will kind of summarize all the algorithms that we've learned which one to use when. So let's start with our real symmetric matrices because those are very good matrices. Real means all the elements of the matrix are real. So we write A is a member of R n by n and symmetric means it transpose is the same as itself. So A transpose is equal to A. So the moment you have such matrices, the eigenvalues are real and it can be proven fairly easily and it's there in the textbook. Of course, when you're trying to prove that something is real, then you have to prove that it's not complex. So you have to step into the territory of complex numbers a little bit and you have to deal with complex conjugates. Now, eigenvectors for such matrices are complete, meaning they are full set and they are orthogonal too. So that is important. So when I say orthogonal, once again, what I mean is if you have an eigenspace instead of eigenvectors, then you have the freedom of choosing an orthonormal basis in the eigenspace and that way the eigenvectors will turn out to be orthogonal. Remember eigenvectors specify only directions in the space so for that reason any vector that is along the direction of the eigenvector is an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue. What that means is that we are free to normalize the eigenvectors so when you have orthogonal eigenvectors we can always have orthonormal eigenvectors so the matrix where we have placed eigenvectors as columns which we call S, will become an orthonormal matrix. The signs of the pivots and the signs of eigenvalues are connected. The number of uh, positive pivots is the same as the number of positive eigenvalues. The number of negative pivots, the same as the number of uh, negative eigenvalues. So this is Sylvester's law of inertia. So if you take a general square matrix, the elements are real. Eigenvalues for such matrices can be complex numbers. We saw one example, the rotation matrix in uh, R2. The eigenvalues turned out to be imaginary, purely imaginary in that case and the eigenvectors also they were vectors over the field of complex numbers. Now if you place the eigenvalues regardless of the fact that they are actually complex in a matrix you have the lambda matrix which is a diagonal matrix and eigenvectors can be placed in a matrix also a complex matrix this time. So this statement still is always true a is equal to s lambda this is always true because what I'm saying here is just the matrix version of what I said here by definition it comes from the definition but on top of that if I know that S is invertible, then I can say that A is equal to S lambda S inverse because I'm just multiplying by S inverse on the right of the left hand side and the right hand side. And then I get that and that is eigenvalue decomposition or diagonalization. Now that is for a general real matrix. But if I know that the matrix is a real and symmetric, then I have a real eigenvalue eigenvalues and uh, orthogonal eigenvectors. Eigenvectors corresponding to two eigenvalues that are not the same, meaning distinct eigenvectors, they're all orthogonal to each other, which means you can choose the eigenvectors to be orthonormal really. So the S matrix can be written as an orthonormal matrix and our symbol for orthonormal matrices is actually Q. We know that an orthonormal matrix is always invertible because the 
an inverse it's just a transpose what what that means is that we can write a as s lambda s inverse which is the same as q lambda q inverse and now q inverse is q transpose so we can write this as a is equal to q lambda q transpose and that is called the spectral theorem first let's see what this guy is actually saying the statement is saying a is equal to q lambda q transpose are the eigenvalues for a real symmetric matrix positive no it's not guaranteed to be positive no not at all it can be anything in fact let me say this at this point a real symmetric matrix let's say 5 3 minus 1 0 everywhere else what are the eigenvalues of this matrix here if you were to write the a minus lambda i and take the determinant what do you think you will get what you will get for this uh, determinant is uh, 5 minus lambda 3 minus lambda and minus 1 minus lambda and zeros everywhere else and that determinant which is the, the product of the diagonals 5 minus lambda 3 minus lambda minus 1 minus lambda and when you equate that to 0 that is a characteristic equation the roots of which will give you the eigenvalue so you can see the eigenvalues right here 5 is an eigenvalue lambda 1 3 is uh, the second eigenvalue and the third one is minus 1 so you can construct matrices so that you get the eigenvalues that you want you just have to put them on the diagonal when you have a diagonal matrix eigenvalues are just sitting on the diagonal right and this matrix is real this is in uh, r3 by 3 and it's symmetric because it's a diagonal matrix i can actually go one step further and write another matrix based on the same matrix here 0 here 0 here 0 here but let's say 15 here 21 there 35 here what do you think the eigenvalues of this matrix would be if you were to write the characteristic polynomial which is this guy it's going to be the same so the moment you have a triangular matrix it's very easy to compute the determinant and it's very easy to compute the the eigenvalues too because eigenvalues are just sitting on the diagonal so we were talking about spectral theorem let's take a look at uh, what this guy is telling us a is equal to q lambda q transpose so remember this is for a real matrix and it's for a symmetric matrix. so what any matrix does to the vectors whose tips fall on the unit circle would be to take those vectors to vectors whose tips fall on some ellipse then you know that okay there is an ellipse you don't know anything more about the ellipse and that's it but if i know that it is q lambda q transpose that is a decomposition of a i can actually do it one by one so when i take a times x i'm actually taking q lambda q transpose times x so q transpose will will multiply x first so that multiplication q is an orthonormal matrix so q transpose also is an orthonormal matrix which is a rotation matrix it rotates the the coordinates through some angle i showed this rotation through uh, an angle in the clockwise direction okay and the second thing that applies to that product there is lambda which is a scaling lambda is a diagonal matrix and whatever numbers you have will scale the corresponding uh, components of the vector so it scales so it might it might expand one axis and it might uh, squash the other axis and the second q will rotate the the ellipse again so that rotation will take it to the orientation which is specified by the eigenvectors so that's what it is doing so that is the action of a decomposed into three matrices easier to understand so that is what q lambda q transpose is doing and that is its action that we can see but let's look at the q lambda q transpose once more by expanding it out kind of algebraically and if you expand it you will have a q transpose coming from uh, the q transpose matrix because it's the columns of q are q1 q2 q3 etc and q transpose the rows of uh, q transpose will then be q1 q2 q3 or transpose so when you multiply what you have in between is just a number so that number can be commuted with the multiplication then you will get q1 times q1 transpose that's what will come out of this for one term and then you will have for the second lambda you will have q2 times q2 transpose and so on this in fact is actually telling you the orientation and the size of the ell ellipsoid if you think about it but what it is actually telling you is something a bit deeper if you remember q1 q1 transpose that product that is a matrix that is a rank one matrix because it's all built upon just q1 and more than that it is actually the projection matrix a projection matrix that will take any vector to the vector q1 it is a projection matrix on to the vector q1 if i have a vector a the projection matrix is a a transpose by a transpose a that is a projection matrix it will project any vector any vector 
vector b will be projected onto a so pb equal to b hat and b hat will be some scale version of uh, a so that is what projection is now if i know that uh, a is, is a unit vector let's call it q1 a is equal to q1 then all i have to do is to put q1 wherever i see a in the expression of p so p is going to be q1 q1 transpose divided by q1 transpose q1 what's that number that's going to be equal to 1 because uh, q is normalized it's a unit vector i don't have to have anything here that is just one so the projection matrix that will take any vector to the subspace defined by q1 or the projection onto the vector q1 is just q1 q1 transpose because q1 is a unit vector so what it is saying is that uh, any real symmetric matrix can be written or decomposed into projections onto orthogonal subspaces orthogonal subspaces each subspace is basically just a direction it's just a subspace of one dimension more than that each such decomposition is actually a rank one matrix so why is that important so this could be the basis of some data compression algorithm for instance suppose you've managed to uh, to sort the eigenvectors in terms of its absolute value such that the absolute value of lambda one is the highest lambda two is the second highest and so on and if you're trying to compress a as a data compression algorithm like zip or whatever then you know that if the numbers say lambdas beyond two let's say lambda one and lambda two are fairly big and everything like lambda three up to lambda n are small in comparison to lambda one absolute value again in that case you can ignore the rest and say that a is approximately equal to just these two the rest are not important they are like almost like noise so if i have a let's say 100 by 100 matrix i would need 10,000 uh, memory locations to store it but if I were to write it this way, I would need one location to store that and 100 locations to store Q1 and one more location for that and 100 more for Q2. So it is 202 memory locations that I need instead of 10,000 memory locations. So that is a pretty good data compression algorithm. Probably not the best, there are probably better ones, but you have a data compression algorithm right there. More than that, you can kind of tweak the compressibility that you want by the amount of variability that you're capturing in terms of the lambdas. Then let's look at another the potential algorithm to compute eigenvalues so the sylvester's law of inertia also applies to real and symmetric matrices the signs of positive pivots uh, the number of positive pivots would be the number of uh, positive eigenvalues so that could be an algorithm i would invite you to actually go and uh, implement this algorithm maybe in sage math because computation of pivots is uh, is fairly cheap because it's a uh, gaussian elimination those things are cheap compared to determinants and all that then once you have the pivot and the number of positive ones what you do is shift the matrix by alpha and then you know that uh, the eigenvalues will get, get shifted by alpha this we proved last week shifting means just adding alpha times i and then you look at the, the number of eigenvalues that flip sign that would indicate the number of eigenvalues that are in the range zero to alpha so you can play with the range you can narrow down the range zero in on to the eigenvalue and that is possible not very easy this is not a very good algorithm but it is possible to do it and you can also use the fact that the product of the pivots is a product of the eigenvalues product of the pivots would be the diagonal elements and that would be the product of the eigenvalues too diagonal elements or the eigenvalues once you have the, the ref once you have done the gaussian elimination it's remember it's an upper triangular matrix and the determinant is just the product of the diagonal elements let's tread into the field of uh, complex numbers okay and talk about hermitian matrices so if you have a matrix over the field of uh, complex numbers c n by n this time and if you have vectors that are also over the field of complex numbers then in general the eigenvalues are going to be complex numbers okay so the vectors and matrices are all over the field of complex numbers even though we have vectors with complex numbers as elements we would like to have the size the norm the length of the vector to be real that is reasonable thing to ask right because it's a length and it cannot really have a complex number as a length so we would like it to be real i'm talking about euclidean norm this time but remember our definition of the norm is that the square of the norm is the is x transpose x for euclidean norm and that will just turn out to be the sum of the squares of the elements and if you blindly use that for a complex vector then each element is a complex number and a plus ib squared is not a real number so the sum is not a real number which is not not ideal we would like it to be real so one potential solution for this uh, problem that you are encountering that we want real norms even though the vectors are actually complex is to use 
complex conjugate. Remember, complex conjugate flipping the sign of the imaginary part. If you think of a complex conjugate times the number, then it is a square minus ib the whole square, which is a square plus b square, and that is greater than zero and it is a real number to begin with. And this complex conjugation becomes an interesting thing to do with, with uh, complex vectors, and we can define a transpose with of a vector or a matrix as taking the complex conjugate first for each element and then taking the transpose and that transpose is called the Hermitian transpose so what you do is you have a complex matrix or a vector complex conjugate each element and then take the transpose and then if you define the dot product as not the transpose times the vector but the Hermitian transpose times the vector and that then we can guarantee that this number is going to be greater than or equal to zero but is, is a real number and now we come to the symmetry as defined for complex uh, matrices. It's not if the transpose is the same as itself, but if it, if the complex conjugate transpose is the same as itself, the so conjugate transpose, and then it's called a Hermitian matrix. So what we are looking for is a Hermitian transpose is equal to a, then it's a Hermitian matrix. So Hermitian matrix is like the generalization of a symmetric matrix, but in the field of a complex number. This is actually used extensively in, uh, in quantum mechanics because the matrices that are Hermitian have interesting properties as uh, operators in quantum mechanics and also the vectors there are all complex vectors infinite dimensional but still complex vectors all right so let's look at eigen properties of Hermitian matrices as opposed to real symmetric matrices so wherever we use real symmetric we can actually use Hermitian because for a real matrix if it is Hermitian it is going to be symmetric because complex conjugate of a real number is the same real number that is in fact a test for the realness of a number if a complex conjugate is the same as a that means there is no imaginary part and then it is a real number so the set of real symmetric matrices would be a subset of Hermitian matrices and what we can say is the eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices are real which in fact is a property that is uh, used in uh, in uh, quantum mechanics if I remember right and the proof of this thing is in the textbook now the complex vectors are not that important for uh, computer science as of now but by the time you reach your uh, the pinnacle of your career maybe complex numbers and complex complex fields might become important because people are working with uh, quantum computing and uh, their things are going to be over the field of complex numbers and there are probably data science algorithms that will come up that will be over the field of uh, complex numbers. In fact, I was a, a, a program chair of one of the conferences and there was a paper that was written with uh, complex numbers uh, being used because it was trying to use uh, quantum mechanics kind of ideas in data science. Even though as of now you may not find any direct application in computer science, it might come up. Eigenvectors of Hermitian matrices are orthogonal just like real symmetric matrices too. Orthogonal means can be chosen to be orthogonal. The proof of this one also is in the textbook. Now another reason for me to tell you this thing is that uh, since Hermitian is like the superset of symmetric or real symmetric, some people I think just because they like the name Hermitian might use Hermitian whenever they mean symmetric. So if you go to math stack overflow and look up some problem you might see the word Hermitian being used. Just understand that it is actually just symmetric in the case of real matrices. There's another one that is called unitary which is orthonormal for the case of uh, uh, complex numbers too. So if you see unitary somewhere read it as orthonormal. Now uh, Markov matrices this is the one that we used in uh, Google page rank algorithm. So its properties is that all elements are between 0 and 1 inclusive meaning it could be 0 it, it could be 1 and each column will add up to 1. Sum up all the columns and create a new row out of it you'll get 1 1 1 everywhere. So let me just state that mathematically a matrix is a Markov matrix if it is real square and real not symmetric and if the elements are between 0 and 1 and if each column adds up to 1 then it's a Markov matrix so the fact that uh, elements are between 0 and 1 should indicate to you that maybe we're talking about some kind of probabilities we are and we are actually talking about transition probabilities between states so Markov chain is a is a way in which you would uh, model the evolution of a system by describing the system, the parameters of the system as a vector and saying that from one is instant to the next, its evolution is a matrix multiplication. And that matrix will turn out to be a Markov matrix because you are actually talking about the probabilities of uh, each parameter going to a different parameter. If this is for that reason, it's also called stochastic matrices. Stochastic is just a fancy name.
name for probabilistic. So here the columns add up, add up to one. You could think of uh, rows ad adding up to one. So that'd be like the transpose of a, a, a Markov matrix. And that is called the right stochastic matrix. Now the properties is that at least one of the eigenvalues is one. It's got a magnitude one. And that is interesting to prove. And that's an imaginative proof. So the way, the fancy way of proving it is taking a vector u, which is a row of ones. Okay. And my Markov matrix is a consider a transpose a transpose in which means each row will add up to one each row will add up to one because in a each column added up to one take the transpose each row will add up to one and a transpose u will be a linear combination of the columns of a transpose let's do it using an example rather than a, a general version a equal to a 0 0.95 0 0.05 0 0.7 as you can see they add up to one the sum here is one and the numbers are between zero and one so there's a markov matrix now a transpose is going to be equal to and let me construct a vector u is equal to one one and then thinking of the product a transpose u what will that turn out to be that will turn out to be multiplication on the right by a vector so it's a linear combination of the columns of the matrix on the left which is a transpose so it's a linear combination of uh, this and this these two columns or well, what kind of linear combination weighted by number one so it's just a sum and that will turn out to be 0.95 plus 0 0.05 that is 1 and the second one is 0.3 plus 0.7 that is 1 also by the property of Markov matrix because in A the columns added up to 1 in uh, A transpose the rows have to add up to 1 and so this is the same as u which means it's the same as 1 times u and now A transpose u is equal to 1 times u which is like lambda times u with lambda equal to 1 so it is an eigenvector with eigenvalue 1 so A transpose has an eigenvalue lambda equal to 1. Now A and A transpose will have the same eigenvalues because the characteristic polynomial for A is A minus lambda i. Okay for A transpose is going to be A minus lambda i transpose determinant. They are the same because the determinant of a transpose is the same as the original determinant. So the characteristic polynomial is the same being determinants. Transposition doesn't make any difference. So the eigenvalues are going to be the same. That means A has an eigenvalue. A has an eigenvalue of 1. So that's what we set out to proof i proved it by an example but the example actually uses the property of markov matrices okay so u is an eigenvector with lambda equal to one and a and a transpose will have the same eigenvalues because the characteristic polynomials are the same so that means a has at least one eigenvalue equal to one it could be more but there's at least one now the second property this is proven in the textbook actually is very easy to prove using the same idea of a u as a vector of all ones that uh, the product of two markov matrices is a Markov matrix. Take a look at the textbook to see the proof. That is a very easy to prove. And another one is uh, all eigenvalues will have to be less than or equal to 1. So there's one eigenvalue that is equal to 1 or so 1 or more. The rest will have to be less than or equal to 1 in absolute value. Now let's look at uh, things like steady states. Take the difference equation much like the one that we use for the Fibonacci series. The k plus 1 state is dependent on the kth state by the multiplication of a matrix A and you can talk about the behavior of the system based on the behavior of the eigenvalues of A. If all eigenvalues are less than 1 in absolute value, that means as k goes to infinity, all these values will tend to 0. So the system will tend to 1 state. Okay. And if the largest eigenvalue, which is called the dominant eigenvalue, is more than 1, then much like the Fibonacci series, the state is going to grow exponentially. So system is not stable. It's going to grow like that eigenvalue to the power k. Remember our eigenvalue for a Fibonacci series was the golden ratio, the, the dominant one. And Fibonacci numbers actually grew like the golden ratio to the power k. And if you have an eigenvalue equal to one, again, in terms of uh, absolute value, then that implies a steady state. And Markov matrices do have eigenvalue at least one equal to one. But there's possible variations. If you have multiple eigenvalues equal to one in absolute value, then it's possible for the system to oscillate between different uh, steady states. And if you have a negative eigenvalue, then oscillation might happen with the sign flips. If you remember, a permutation matrix had an eigenvalue minus one. There was one eigenvector, one minus 
minus 1 with an eigenvalue minus 1 and that might lead to oscillations with the sine flips. Remember permutation matrices they're all Markov matrices. Now let's take uh, an example that it's a migration pattern between uh, poor countries and rich countries. So people in poor countries they tend to migrate to rich countries and let's say every year 30% of the people who are going to the rich countries and people in rich countries some of them might migrate to poor countries to work as uh, expats or whatever and let's say that's five percent in reality these numbers are probably much much smaller and let's say the current population in the world the rich population is two billion and the poor population is five billion so totally seven and that's constant nobody is dying nobody is uh, being born does it have a steady state and the answer will come if you can write the state of the system next year compared to this year the state i'm defining the state as the rich population and a poor population as a vector state at time zero is two and five two billion for rich rich people and five billion for poor people and the markov matrix that will uh, describe the, the transition to next 0.95.05.3.7 so 95 percent of the people in the rich countries will stay put because only five percent migrate 70 percent of the people in the poor countries will stay put 30 percent will, will migrate so that is the, the transition probabilities now if you do an eigen analysis on this one and just find the eigenvalues of the matrix a it is 95 percent which is 19 by 20 five percent which is a uh, 1 over 20, 30 percent, 70 percent. And we can see that there is an eigenvalue 1 with the eigenvector 1 and 1 sixth. If you just do the multiplication, 19 by 20 times 1 plus 3 by 10 times 1 over 6. So that is 3 by 60. That is 1 over 20. So 1 over 20 plus 19 over 20, I get 1. And the second element will be 1 over 20 times 1 plus 7 over 10 times 1 over 6. That is 7 over 60. So 1 over 20 is a 3 over 60. So they add up to 10 over 60. That is 1 over 6. So A times uh, S is equal to 1 times S. So lambda is equal to 1. And the statement is that the steady state is going to be equal to this eigenvector but remember eigenvector can be scaled we will scale it by the fact that our total population has to remain 7 billion so i will just scale it up by some factor factor 6 here so this is my eigenvector i multiply this by 6 i get 6 and 1 and then they add up to the total population 7 billion so the scaling factor i need is 6 and that is going to be the steady state so if you start from a population of 2 billion in uh, rich countries and, uh, and uh, 5 billion in poor countries if you let the system propagate at some point in time the steady state will be 6 billion in rich countries and uh, 1 billion in poor countries with that piece of information maybe you can see why we rich people are very reluctant to have for poor people come into our countries now that is using eigen analysis but we can also use power iteration which is what we did what we did is to take the matrix a and multiply x zero which is two five to get x one and then take that and propagate it to x two using the same matrix again and i get some other value and keep doing it over time by the time i reach uh, the 30th iteration or something it would have stabilized to six billion and one billion positive definite matrices the definition is this a real symmetric matrix is positive definite if its eigenvalues are all positive a real symmetric matrix so if it is not real or if it is not symmetric by our definition the one i stated here it cannot be positive definite now that particular part of the definition some people don't like it so there may be some people who might say that uh, the matrices don't have to be symmetric to be positive definite or they need to have is the property that all the eigenvalues are positive and the there are good theoretical reasons for it and there was a mathematics paper that I saw while doing some research on it that actually argued for that but I think the general definition is for real symmetric matrix matrices and that's what we will stick to so real symmetric matrix is positive definite if its eigenvalues are all positive real square and symmetric the same definition in mathematical lingo for all eigenvalues they have to be positive strictly greater than zero if some of them are actually zero then we call such matrices positive semi definite so remember if an eigenvalue is uh, zero, that means the matrix itself is not uh, invertible, it's singular. So if it is positive semi definite with an eigenvalue equal to zero, then A is a singular matrix. So people, some people do define negative definite and negative semi definite, but those things are not that common. So let me tell you a bunch of tests for positive definiteness, and they are also properties of uh, positive definite matrices. So the first thing is actually from the definition, are the eigenvalues or positives? Are the pivots? or positive then the matrix is positive definite this comes from the Sylvester's law of inertia and the third one is an interesting one for any vector 
not equal to zero, can you show that x transpose ax is greater than zero? And we will see what that means. So I'm not saying try this vector or that vector, but try a general vector and mathematically prove that this product, this triple product is greater than zero, meaning it's like a like a full square or something. And then you know that A is a positive definite. Now another test is that if all leading subdeterminants, so I haven't defined what leading subdeterminants are, but if those guys are positive, then the matrix is a positive definite. So let me define what leading subdeterminants are. If I have a big matrix, square matrix, real matrix, I look at the determinant of the smallest one starting from the top left. That would be just the first element. If that is positive, that subdeterminant is uh, positive. And I would take the second one that is from uh, second row and second column. So that little square matrix, two by two square matrix, also should have a positive determinant. And I'll keep going. And the kth one will have k rows and k columns. And that is the kth subdeterminant. And the nth subdeterminant will be the whole determinant. So every one of them will have to be positive for the matrix to be positive definite. So that's another test. So that is uh, the kth subdeterminant that I've highlighted there. Kth sub matrix out of which the kth subdeterminant will come. Another one, a matrix B is positive definite if, if it can be written as uh, B is equal to A transpose A for some invertible A. So let's use these uh, tests and apply the tests in certain cases. Suppose I give you a matrix and tell you that it is positive definite. Is it inverse positive definite? So you don't have to actually compute the inverse which is a horrible problem by itself and then compute the eigenvalues that will be another horrible problem and then see if they are positive and that would be brute force way of doing it but you can apply test one which says that a has all the eigenvalues greater than zero a inverse will have eigenvalues equal to one over lambda the eigenvalues of an inverse are the reciprocals of the eigenvalues of the original matrix so if the eigenvalues of a are positive then the reciprocals are also positive so a inverse is positive definite if a and b are positive definite how about a plus b but you can apply the third test which is x transpose x sandwiching the matrix and this expand it out you know that this is positive because a is given to be positive definite and this also is positive so the sum is positive so a plus b indeed is positive definite the next one if you have any matrix not a square matrix any matrix but full column rank though the gram matrix a transpose a is a positive definite so you can use the third test a transpose a transpose ax and i realized that this guy here the product of transposes is actually transpose of a product in the reverse order and now look at this is ax transpose and ax that is just the uh, norm of uh, ax square and that has to be greater than zero as long as x is not zero so a transpose a is positive definite unless a ax equal to zero which means either x equal to zero it cannot be that ax equal to zero without x being equal to zero because we said that it is a is a full column right that means a transpose a which is an n by n matrix is a full rank matrix it's rank and it's the same as the rank of a so you cannot have null space that means you cannot have non-zero x giving you a zero and that's why the gram matrix is positive definite now there is another one which is uh, interesting a is given to be positive definite let's take some matrix m which is invertible so square and invertible and take m inverse a m this is positive definite let's verify that let's call this matrix b and then a becomes m b m inverse we know that a s is equal to lambda s and where i see a i just put the expression i have for a and i get that now i know that m is invertible so i can take m to the other side with inverse and then i get b m inverse times s is equal to lambda times m inverse s so if i just read it properly i see this vector here m inverse times s which is just a vector and m inverse times s over there which is the same vector so b times some vector is lambda times the same vector which means lambda is an eigenvalue and that vector m inverse s is the eigenvector if a is positive definite then this guy which we call b has the same eigenvalues so it, since eigenvalues are the same if a is positive definite all the eigenvalues are positive so all the eigenvalues of b are positive too and b is positive definite so same eigenvalues that is interesting but the eigenvectors are not the same eigenvectors are different so if a is positive definite so is uh, m inverse a m later today we will call a and b equal to this guy we will call them similar matrices now let's take uh, a look at uh, something called quadratic forms all these topics that i'm telling you today the actual computer science application of those things may be dubious they may not be there but i'm telling you these things because i'm hoping that some of you later in life might use some of these concepts and apply and find some nice application in computer science so if i don't tell you these things 
there is little chance that these things might occur to you because you haven't been exposed to them. But since now that you have some exposure to these uh, these concepts, maybe when you're dealing with some data science problems or some algorithm, you might think that, hey, this looks similar to what uh, Prof told us a long time ago. And maybe I can try that. I mean, maybe you will look it up and try it and maybe come up with something that is brand new and might be valuable and that might you know, expand the horizon of our knowledge. Really. So that is my hope. So even though some of these things are more conceptual and theoretical, don't discount them thinking that they are useless. All right, let's take a real symmetric matrix. So A, B and B, C. So it is symmetric because B here, B here, and they are all real numbers. And conditions for positive definite, this subdeterminant has to be positive. Positive, and the whole determinant has to be positive. So A has to be greater than zero and determinant of A has to be greater than zero. And the determinant of A is AC minus B square. Now let's look at uh, X transpose AX with some general X vector, which is X1 and X2. And if I do the expansion, what will I get? A is equal to A, B, B, C. I'm taking X, X1, X2, X transpose AX, write it out more explicitly x1 x2 uh, row a b b c matrix and x1 and x2 as a column if i do the multiplication here I multiply out what i will get a multiplying x1 there and x1 here so i will get a x1 square plus i'll get c x2 squares and in between you will get x1 x2 the cross term with b and b again in two different ways now if you look at uh, the expansion that i've written here that is a pure quadratic that's what they mean by by a pure quadratic it's a polynomial in which each variable x1 and x2 will always appear in order 2 so there is no bx1 term or bx2 term there's only bx1 x2 it is a quadratic in x1 and x2 or x2 by itself or x1 by itself no constant terms now suppose i take an example a and b i give numbers but for c i keep it as a c then i ask you the question what's the determinant of this matrix 2 6 6 c that turns out to be 2c minus 6 times 6, 36. And I want that guy to be positive for the matrix to be positive definite. So C has to be greater than 18. If it, if it is greater than 18, then 2 times something greater than 18 minus 36 will be positive. So if I take 20, so what I have here, 20. And if I do the multiplication, just like I did here, A x1 square, so 2 x1 square, 2 B x1 x2, so 12 x1 x2, and 20 x2 square. So that's what I will get. And if I want to prove that this is positive, what I will do is to try to write this as sum of squares. If I do that I can pull out 2 and then see that it's x1 plus 3x2 square so that will have 6x x1 x2 times 2 so that is I get 12 I get this guy I get this guy and the last one is a 9x2 square times 2 that is 18 but I need two more so I had two more there but you can see that it's got two terms and each one of the two terms will have to be positive because you see only squares there it doesn't matter what the value of x1 and x2 are this will be always positive any non-zero value of x1 and x2 will give you positive numbers here that is how you would prove that for a general x1 and x2 or general vector x, x transpose a x is a positive and so a is a positive definite matrix. Now one more thing I want to highlight about this. Suppose I want to do a Gaussian elimination on this matrix here. You would multiply the first row by 3, subtract it from the second row. So this will become 0 and the second one multiply this by 3. So 18, 20 minus 18, I'll get 2 there. So I'll have pivots 2 and 2 and the multiple prior that I used is 3 and if I look at the completion of square I see 2's here and the 3 there so completing the squares to prove that it is positive definite is actually has row reduction in it so you can retrieve the pivots and the multipliers from the, the square that you're writing down which is interesting all these things are interconnected in the world of uh, linear algebra nothing stands on its own quadratic forms it's a deep field it's a portal to a deep field each one of the topics that we did today is actually a portal to a deep field complex uh, matrices of course markov matrices that is a starting point of uh, markov chains here in markov models mathematical modeling and uh, positive definiteness and this one also quadratic forms also we said some time ago that uh, row rank is the same as uh, column rank for a general matrix so m by n matrix not an n by n matrix and we saw that the row reduction the process did not change the, the row space so it did not change the row rank and row reduction of a general matrix will give you as many 
many rows as the rank of the matrix and there will be uh, an identity matrix hiding there. So I'm talking about uh, Gauss Jordan elimination, an identity matrix shuffled in with uh, columns corresponding to free variables. And suppose I call this guy by a name R1. I know that the row space of R1 and A will be the same. So the row rank of R1 and uh, A will be the same. The dimension of the row space, that will be the same because the row spaces are the same for these two matrices. Now that's because the row operations do not change the row space. And if I want to think about the column rank, I can apply starting from R1, I can apply column operations on that without changing the column space of that matrix R1. So if I do that, I will eventually get a bunch of zero columns because just like we got zero rows by doing row operations, we'll get a zero columns and I'll get an identity matrix by itself. That is a different matrix R2. So the column rank of these two matrices will be the same. Column rank of R2 will be the same as the column rank of R1 and the row rank of R2 will be the same as the row rank of A. So this is because the column operations do not change the column space. So the column rank of uh, R1, in other words, you can see that the row rank of and column rank of this particular matrix he here is just R because everything else is zero. We reach there without changing the row space and the column space. Row rank equals equal to column rank. But we know this in uh, many different ways. We know that uh, row rank is the same as the number of linearly independent rows, which is the same as the number of pivots. Column rank is the number of pivots looking at from the column side. And there is only one set of pivots. We prove it in many different ways. This is another proof that I saw somewhere. And I thought I would share this also with you. Another thing I want to say, this it is probably a bit beside the point and a bit more involved than the other one. Rank of A is the same as rank of A transpose A is the same as rank of A A transpose. So that is done by looking at uh, the, the null space of these guys and comparing it to the null space of A and then using the, the rank nullity theorem. And I would ask you to go through this proof and understand it. But what I want to highlight is this fact. Rank of A is the same as rank of A transpose is the same as rank of A A transpose. And most importantly is the rank of uh, the gram matrix A transpose A. That we have to remember. So that brings us to the gram matrix. For a full column rank tall matrix, N is the number of columns. So all of them are linearly independent. So the rank is N. We looked at it and that was the basis of uh, linear regression, least squares, etc. A transpose A is a small matrix. M is much bigger than N, so many more rows than uh, columns. Take A transpose A, that becomes a small matrix. And that is full rank because the rank of that guy is the same as the rank of A. And now A transpose A is N by N. So every column has a has a pivot, every row has a pivot. So it's a very nice matrix. And we saw that it was positive definite too. So it's like the king of matrices here. It's got many applications in machine learning. In statistics, for instance, the covariance matrix after doing the zero centering. Similarity of matrices. So A is is similar to B, we saw this, if B is M inverse A M for some matrix M. So we have lambda is equal to, to lambda is equal to S inverse A S because A is equal to S lambda S inverse. So we can just rewrite it this way. So we know that A, A and lambda are similar to each other, not merely in the shape of the symbol, but also by our definition of similarity. So similar matrices have the same eigenvalues, but not the same eigenvectors. So same eigenvalues, let me prove this once B is uh, M inverse A M. So A is that. And eigenvalue equation, I can just plug in the expression for A from here and left multiply by M inverse. So then you will see that B times the vector is lambda times the same vector. So lambda is an eigenvalue of B, but the vector itself is, is different. Corollary to that is that A, B and B, A have the same eigenvalues, which will come about because you can take M, the similarity matrix that you are using to be B and then do do the multiplication and you can prove that uh, a b and b a are similar to each other and so they have to have the same eigenvalues some examples so i have this uh, 2 1 1 2 eigenvalues should add up to 4 because that is a trace and uh, the product of eigenvalue should be 3 so this that is because 2 times 2 minus 1 times 1 that is 3 that is a determinant so you will see that eigenvalues are 3 and 1 and if you plug in you will see that the eigenvectors are actually 1 1 and uh, 1 minus one. You can see it here. If, if I take 1 and 1, I'll add this guy with this. I get 3 and 3. So that is 3 times 1 and 1. So with eigenvalue 3, I have the eigenvector 1 and 1. If I take my, 1 and minus 1, that is uh, 2 minus 1, 1 minus 2, that, it has, that gives me 1 and minus 1. So that is an eigenvector with uh, eigenvalue equal to 1. Okay? So if I take the matrix I'm using for similarity as the eigenvector matrix, I get uh, the eigenvector matrix 1, 1 and 1 minus 1 and I get similarity right there. Some properties 
let me just go through the properties of uh, similar matrices. Take some other invertible matrix, invertible uh, matrix M. So this is invertible and the inverse. So swap diagonals one and one. So swapping one and one. Change the sign. So zero and minus four. And determinant here is uh, is uh, one times one minus zero. So determinant is one. So that is easy. So that is the inverse. So if I do inverse times matrix times the other matrix, I get some matrix that looks very different from A. You wouldn't know what why these matrices are similar but let's look at the, the trace and the determinant the trace is of uh, 6 minus 2 that is 4 the determinant is minus 12 plus 3 plus 15 that is 3 so same trace and same determinant which it has to be because uh, they have the same eigenvalues so some properties they have the same characteristic polynomial you can write down the characteristic polynomial as uh, lambda minus each eigenvalue multiplied so it's the same but you can prove it in a different way fancier way in the textbook you will see the proof they have the same determinant because it's product of eigenvalues and if a is positive definite so is b because same eigenvalues the trace is the same because sum of eigenvalues same rank that comes from the, the silver law of uh, inertia because the number of positive pivots is the same as the number of uh, positive eigenvalues and you can just see that the number of pivots will be the same the number of pivots is the rank and one extra thing almost purely mathematical here is that similarity is what they call an equivalence relation which means it's reflexive a matrix is similar to itself is symmetric which means if a matrix is similar to another one a similar to b means that b is similar to a and it is transitive a similar to b and b similar to c would mean that that A is similar to C. Who is very easy to prove all these things. One thing I want to say is about the diagonalizability, the connection between similarity and diagonalizability. So we know that if A is similar to B and they have the same eigenvalues that we know, so we know that they will diagonalize to the same eigenvalue matrix if they are diagonalizable. So people use this as a definition of similarity. A matrix is similar to another matrix if they both diagonalize to the, to the same eigenvalue matrix. This is a uh, fine as far as it goes. Oh, by the way, by same, we are allowed to shuffle the eigenvalues because uh, there's no uh, information in the order of the eigenvalues in the eigenvalue matrix. So shuffling is okay. So same diagonal matrix means same up to a change in the order. So it basically means that uh, similar matrices form something like families of matrices with the same eigenvalue matrix. So all the matrices that diagonalize to the same eigenvalue matrix are similar to each other and and they form a family. If it is a different eigenvalue matrix, then there's a different family. So infinite number of families of definition of similarity using uh, diagonalizability is a bit incomplete because if something is not diagonalizable, then how do you say similarity? What do you say about similarity? That's where the next topic called the Jordan normal form will come in. It's also called the Jordan canonical form, like I told you. Canonical is a word that mathematicians love. So Jordan normal form will take us to the next topic called the Jordan blocks. So let's look at uh, diagonalization one thing that we know is that if the eigenvalues are distinct the eigenvectors are linearly independent and we know that if uh, the eigenvector matrix s is invertible then the matrix can be diagonalized so if the eigenvalues are distinct the matrix s is invertible because columns are linearly independent but if the eigenvalues are repeated you're not sure it may or may not be diagonalizable so repeated another bad word for it is degenerate but what we should know is that real data in data science you seldom come across Across uh, degeneracy because the data points tend to be measurements and there's statistical fluctuations etc so there's no degeneracy typically so if you take the identity matrix all the eigenvalues are just one because eigenvalues are the values that are sitting on the diagonal they are repeated n times so that n times degenerate but it is diagonalizable in fact identity matrix is diagonal to begin with there's no extra effort needed to diagonalize it but if you remember the shear matrix that was not diagonalizable a general form of shear matrix is a lambda 0 a lambda if i look at uh, the eigenvalues here they're going to be lambda and it is uh, twice repeated so it degenerate the algebraic multiplicity is 2 but there's only one eigenvector the algebraic multiplicity is 2 geometric multiplicity is only 1 geometric multiplicity is smaller than the algebraic multiplicity and that is the bad situation in that case your matrix is not diagonalizable algebraic multiplicity greater than geometric multiplicity means not diagonalizable 
about. So let's talk about the Jordan normal forms. So let me write a matrix. I'm going to call it J for Jordan, 1 for the size, and lambda for some value on which it depends. So this is a 1 by 1 matrix lambda. I'm going to write J2 lambda. That is a 2 by 2 matrix. That is lambda, lambda in the diagonal, 0 here and 1 here. So if you look at it, you recognize the shear matrix. So this is not diagonalizable. And the third one is going to be lambda, 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 0 here, 1 here, 1 here, and 0 there. Okay. So I have this thing here that is called a super diagonal. That is one uh, one column to the left and one row above the diagonal, the main diagonal. That is called the super diagonal. So I have the repeated eigenvalue along the diagonal and once in the super diagonal and that is the Jordan form. So you can write it for any one of them. JK lambda will have a, this will be A by K matrix and the diagonal element JII will be lambda, the super diagonal, and that will be just one. So if you have distinct eigenvalues, then they will form Jordan box of size one. And if you have repeated with algebraic multiplicity is equal to geometric multiplicity, they will still form Jordan box of one. But repeated with algebraic multiplicity greater than geometric multiplicity, then they will start forming Jordan box of two or three. Okay? So that is the idea. So here I have for J3, I have uh, an algebraic multiplicity of three, but the geometric multiplicity is still one. So Jordan block is a square matrix. The repeated eigenvalue will be along the diagonal once along the super diagonal, which is just one row and one column above the main diagonal. And each Jordan block will have an algebraic multiplicity, same as its size, and a geometric multiplicity of one. So algebraic multiplicity is a K, the size and geometric multiplicity is 1. Now, based on this, there is a theorem that says every square matrix is similar to a Jordan matrix of the same size and the Jordan matrix is called J. And the definition of Jordan matrix is a matrix that is made up of Jordan box along the diagonal. It's going to be zeros below the diagonal and eigenvalues along the diagonal and once here and there in the super diagonal. And Jordan theorem says that every square matrix is similar to that. So it is possible that there are matrices that you cannot diagonalize, but Jordan form is the closest you can get to a diagonal form. Okay? So that is the genius of this uh, cool cat. Now let's move on to algorithms. So these are algorithms to compute eigenvalues. If we have a characteristic polynomial, finding its roots polynomial equal to zero and the roots of that uh, equation is a very hard problem. So if you have a 100 by 100 matrix, no human being will be able to do it by hand and computers will take a horribly long time to do this. One idea that I shared with you is a Sylvester's law of inertia. What you will do is to use the fact that the number of positive pivots is the number of positive eigenvalues. Easy to compute the pivots, Gaussian elimination, and that will give you the number of positive eigenvalues. Shift the matrix by alpha, eigenvalues will get shifted by alpha, and determine the number of eigenvalues above and below of any alpha by shifting it here and there. Really encourage you to go and write this uh, in uh, Sage Math or in uh, Pure Python because it's an interesting exercise. It's not a very good algorithm, I'm going to tell you right now, because you don't know how much to shift uh, alpha by and when you, you can stop, all those things are not obvious. So it's going to be hard. But a much better algorithm is something that we already did while doing the page rank algorithm. That is called power iteration. So start with any random vector, normalize it, and multiply A, the matrix whose uh, eigenvector you're trying to find, and then replace S with that uh, vector. So that's the idea. So it will converge to the dominant eigenvector. It will always converge to the dominant eigenvector eigenvector. Now once you have the eigenvector, then you can see that uh, the eigenvalue can be easily computed by something called the Rayleigh coefficient, which is S transpose AS. So AS will just become uh, lambda S because S is uh, an eigenvector. So lambda times S transpose S divided by S transpose S will give you lambda. So there are a couple of limitations for this. It is kind of sensitive to the initial guess. If you guess poorly, then uh, you may not converge to the dominant an eigenvalue that is one thing and for complex eigenvalues you need to start with a complex initial vector otherwise you may not actually get to the eigenvector these insights are actually from either a website or a video and i have the link to it uh, in the textbook now much better algorithm would be the qr algorithm this uses the fact that similar matrices have the same eigenvalue so our idea would be to get to a similar matrix starting from a and hopefully that similar matrix will be something like a triangle triangular matrix and if it is a triangular matrix then the eigenvalues are just sitting on the diagonal. It's a very imaginative algorithm and it gives you an idea about how you translate these concepts 
to real solutions. So all we need to do is to find a similar matrix that is a triangular. So we will start from the Gram-Schmidt process. We will take A and find its uh, orthonormal version and we will say that is equal to QR. So once we have Q, it's very easy to compute R as you know. And we know that R is an upper triangular matrix. So R is just Q inverse A or Q inverse is just Q transpose. The algorithm goes like this. What you would do is to run the, the Gram-Schmidt process, the QR decomposition, and set up the first A0 is equal to the QR decomposition. So the first A0 will give you Q0. A0 is Q0 R0 because A is QR. What, what about RQ? If you think about RQ, then you can multiply on the left by I, which is uh, Q0 inverse Q0. And if you look at that, you can see that Q0 R0 comes here and Q0 R0 is A0. And so R0 Q0 and A0 are therefore similar. They are similar matrices. So their eigenvalues are going to be the same. So that is uh, tricky and uh, interesting how they thought about that. Now what you do is, is just set A1 next iterative step to be R0 Q0 because we know that the eigenvalues of this guy will be the same as the eigenvalue of that. So we can deal with this and keep doing it. Finally, you will converge to something that is an upper triangular matrix. So the algorithm by itself is actually extremely simple to write. What you would do is take the matrix A and uh, find its Q or decomposition. So get Q and R and then just place RQ in the place of A and they just keep repeating it. QR algorithm has some numerical stability issues I believe. So people have modified it and uh, there are better versions of it. Summarizing all the algorithms that uh, we've seen so far in this uh, course. If you want to solve equations, a really bad idea would be to go the route of uh, determinants of Kramer's rule. A much better way would be to do any kind of uh, row elimination, Gaussian elimination. If you want to find inverses, again determinants would be really bad, do Gauss theorem. If you want to do eigenvalue decomposition, bad idea would be to take the characteristic polynomial and then run some kind of uh, iterative uh, solution to find the roots, or do something more imaginative like the QR algorithm. All these algorithms actually correspond to some decompositions. So let's just list them for the sake of completeness. Gaussian elimination takes A to PLU. It applies to any matrix. P is a permutation, lower triangular matrix, upper triangular matrix. Gauss Jordan will give you the inverse as long as the matrix is invertible. So it's a square invertible matrix. Gram Schmidt will give you Q and R orthonormal and upper triangular. And eigenvalue decomposition will give you the eigenvectors in a matrix and eigenvalues in a different matrix. That would be diagonal. Now there is one decomposition that is quite significant. We haven't mentioned that at all. It's called the uh, Cholesky decomposition. So any positive definite matrix can be written as a LL transpose where L is a lower triangular matrix. And this has significant applications in uh, simulations. If you have a multivariate normal distribution that you want to simulate, that you want to use in your simulation, that means you have the covariance matrix and you want to generate random numbers based on the covariance matrix. In other words, you generate a large number of uh, random numbers and compute the covariance matrix, you want it to be the same as the original covariance matrix that you started from, which is not an easy problem to do. And Cholesky decomposition is the method that will let you do that. In the textbook, I've described this quite well, but that description actually came from uh, a video that is linked to in the textbook. And the guy who was uh, presenting the video is actually a computer scientist, not a mathematician. Well, I mean, he's a mathematician too, but he's more of a computer scientist. So his presentation is from the perspective of a computer science algorithm. So it's very interesting for you to watch that video because it talks about not just how you propagate from one step to another, also about how you overwrite certain parts of the matrix so that you save space, etc. Very nice video. And next week, we will actually get to the king of all decompositions. That will be the singular value decomposition. So let's uh, summarize what we learned. So special matrices, Hermitian, that is a generalization of uh, real symmetric ma matrices into the field of uh, complex numbers. Markov, like probability transition matrices used in uh, Markov chains, positive definite, important class of matrices, gram matrices of positive definite matrix. And then we talked about Jordan box, theoretically very significant, Jordan box and the Jordan theorem and the Jordan norm normal form. Jordan theorem says that the Jordan matrix is made up of a uh, Jordan box and that is the closest you can get to uh, a diagonal matrix for any general matrix. If a matrix is not di diagonalizable, 
it can be made into a Jordan matrix. Real symmetric matrices, real eigenvalues, orthogonal eigenvectors, so diagonalizable. Hermitian means symmetric in complex field. Markov columns add up to one, and all the eigenvalues are less than or equal to one in absolute value, not just in real value. And there is at least one with the value equal to one. Positive definite means all the eigenvalues are greater than zero. All of them are positive. That means it's not a singular matrix. And the test, the most powerful test, is right there. Sandwiching a with x transpose and x. The R matrix is uh, used in uh, finding linear independence for, for one thing. If you have a tall matrix and you don't know if the columns are linearly independent, you compute its uh, gram matrix, which is A transpose A, and then deal with that because it's going to be much smaller, easier to deal with. And the computation of covariance in statistics, Jordan box, and that is uh, with uh, repeater eigenvalues along the diagonal and once along the super diagonal. Algebraic multiplicity is the size of the Jordan box. Geometric multiplicity is one. Then we talked about the spectral theorem, which basically said any real symmetric matrix can be expressed as a sum of a rank one matrices with scaling factors that are uh, eigenvalues. So that has implications in data compression algorithm. Markov is used in mo mathematical modeling, steady state analysis, etc. Positive definite leads to quadratic forms. Gram matrix is a positive definite matrix, and all square matrices are similar to a Jordan matrix. That is a theorem. Then we went on to algorithms and applications. Eigenvalue, power iteration or a QR algorithm would be the right thing to do. And in the textbook, you will see Cholesky decomposition and that you should, you really should take a look because I think that will tell you how to think about linear algebra concept and translate that into an algorithm. So next week, we will top it all off with a singular value decomposition.